this is part two of working with um, some different options for doing a portrait. Um, so before we did one that was about line work and hatching, and this one's going to be about tone. So we are going to start basically the same way um, with some kind of gestural marks to give us some anchors um, to show us where everything is. Then again, we're just going to separate everything out and then go for broke with tone. And it's going to have a totally different effect than the other. And when you do this approach, you need to work really, really soft at first. Um, if you put in too dark values too early, you're going to run into troubles and just generally kind of hate life. So um, having a feather touch is kind of what you really want right now, or the early stages in the, in the portrait. And if you're working with tone, um, you're going to kind of be working with the side of your material. Um, I know that I'm working digitally. Um, and you may be working analog. The approach stays the same. Um, if you're using charcoal or whatever, pastels, doesn't really matter. Um, and, you know, you want to stay loose. Use the model. And in, in this case, the model is just kind of this photo. Um, but don't be addicted to, to the model. You know, what you really want in the end is a good drawing. No one's going to see the model or the reference photo that you used, really. So, um, now that I've got that, I'm going to move the layers apart. And make sure that I can kind of see both. Um, let's see here. There we go. So the tonal approach is going to be a totally different way of way of thinking than what we've done before. So what I'm going to do is essentially just focus on areas of value. And when I think about value, what I mostly think of is differentiation. Um, so what I want to do is take the areas that are dark or relatively darker in shadow and very basically just kind of differentiate them from the areas of light. Now, I don't need to differentiate the shadows from each other at this point. And at this point, I think I might turn on the texture overlay to make it look a little more interesting. Now it's hard to see. Um, and again, if you're using charcoal analog media, it's just feather touch here. Real light. So for the beginnings of the tonal approach, you're going to focus entirely on the dark areas, right? And what I like to think of when I'm focusing on that is, you know, where is the, the dividing line between light and dark? That's what I want to find primarily. And you can see here that it kind of goes from the chin down under the lip, wraps around the lip, goes in, inside the mouth, then goes above the lip, uh, under the nose, hits the nose, goes around the nose, along the, and then it goes up along the the eye, in fact, a lot of the eyes in shadow. Comes down under the dark circles under the eye. And then catches the cheek over here. And then from the chin, it also goes down into the shoulder.
And at this point, you don't really have to worry too much about marks, and you can draw right over any kind of contour line. That's what I love about the tonal approach, is that you don't really have to worry about the outline of things and getting that right. You can just kind of get a tone over a bunch of stuff and draw right over any contour lines without really discriminating at first. Go into the hair, the tone there. Might use some form following marks to get some tone. Might kind of bump up some of the tone in the hair behind this contour of the eye here. Early on in, the, in these stages, you probably will wind up mostly staying out of the light areas, at least at first. So what I've done now, if I zoom out, you'll kind of see this portrait emerge, even though there's not a lot of line work, right? Um, the next stage that I need to do is, now that I've kind of divided light and dark, is I need to go through and, and differentiate where the shadow core is. And the shadow core in this photo um, is going to need to get kind of bumped up, right? Um, the shadow core is, is right along the line where light and dark divide from each other. Um, and I'm also going to develop any cast shadows that I see. So what I want is, when I'm done with this shadow core, is I want this to be really distinct from everything that I've drawn. It so happens that the shadow core is right on the eyebrow up here. I'm going to use that. Also got some shadow core going up the forehead here. And that's going to kind of blend in with the hair. So I don't need to get that differentiated too much. Then the shadow core splits and comes down, down the cheek real softly. And whereas on the nose it was pretty narrow, on the cheek the shadow core is kind of wide and soft and fades very slowly, but it's still there, right? Then for the nose, right about here, I've got uh, a cast shadow to deal with. I've got a cast shadow in the nostril to deal with. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in. Might seem a bit extreme at this point, but that's okay. Then I can kind of start to push in cast shadow inside the mouth here, especially on the far side and the, of either side where it kind of turns into a point. Teeth have a little bit of light on them. And then I want to differentiate the cast shadow of the lip and run that under the lip actually. The idea of a lip being distinct from the rest of the mouth is kind of an illusion, right? It's just the same skin, it just changes direction. It has a slightly different color to it, I guess. Okay, so I need to go back over here, use some of the um, Use some of the natural local value of the eyes here. Try to differentiate that as well as the eyebrows and eyelashes. I can find some spots up in the hair where it's definitely darker and creating some cast shadow. Then I definitely need to separate out the neck. Because there's a distinct difference in that cast shadow down on the neck. So if I zoom out, you can kind of see that I've basically done like another stage of value application here. And so this is kind of becoming very soft 
but still defined as far as like where the forms are. The next thing that I like to do is kind of find areas of absolute darkness and um, maybe this time I need to shrink the tool size a little bit. If you're working with charcoal, you know, maybe get um, a sharper point. And I can see here the eyes are pretty dark. So I'm not going to go to absolute darkness here, but I'm going to push it pretty far down. And what I like to think about is kind of like balancing a math equation. Whatever I do to one side, I'm going to do to the other, right? So if I deepen the iris on one side, I'm going to go that go to the other side and do that too. If I deepen eyelashes, I'm going to do that on both sides. Now, with a tonal approach, I'm not really interested in getting each individual eyelash. I'm just interested in getting the overall value of the eyelash. I can do the same thing with the eyebrows. What matters more to me isn't that I'm getting an accurate portrait, it's that I'm getting an interesting drawing out of it. Don't really care about the model, you know. Um, what you care about is the is the drawing, and so I'm just going to ba basically just bounce back and forth across the drawing, getting some areas of value blocked in. You know, push the eyelids back in space. Do it on both sides. Let me be sure. Get some tone over the eye, the white of the eyes itself because they're kind of grayish in the photo. Not really all that light. Make sure that the form on the inside of the eye goes back in space. Push the value behind the far edge of the nose so that form comes out. You know, push the dark circles under the eyes and get the lower eyelid in. Make sure the whites of the eyes aren't like super bright white because they're definitely not as light as the reflective highlights within the, the irises themselves. I'm going to go back and kind of get in the tone around the dark circles under the eyes. Maybe increase the tool size again because I'm kind of working back to broad strokes. Start to push down cast shadows once more. And I can maybe work into the into the lips, differentiate the lips. Or the tone of the lips. And kind of keep pushing those back into space. Make sure that it's distinct. Push the value around the mouth. And then always, always, always keep stepping back, keep zooming out. If you're working analog, get six feet away. That kind of breaks the myopic view, uh, meaning that when you are right up on it, um, you're not going to notice things that you're, that you're going to notice from far away. Um, you know, I had, there's a lot of stuff that I can tweak um, based on what I see from a distance, right? I can kind of start to fill in some value and get some transitions there that um, hadn't been there yet. And if I need to erase something, what I'm thinking of for my eraser is not as a um, as a full stop thing but as a uh, as a drawing tool so soft erasers kneaded erasers are kind of 
great for this. Um, you know, if you want to get a hard eraser, um, if you're working in charcoal, I definitely recommend that. Um, because a hard eraser can kind of help you out with uh, actually using line work with your eraser, which I think that's really fun to do. You can get positive and negative lines going. Something that Rembrandt might have done. So one of the things is with the tonal approaches, you're probably going to try to get a sense of light developed, right? Otherwise, why use tone? So you may want to just continue to push value down until it looks like there's light spilling on this figure. And up to now, I've kind of ignored a lot of the hair, so I'm going to come back and start to get that in. Because the hair was just kind of becoming this, like, you know, boring white area that I haven't really touched or examined yet. I haven't found anything there. So, as soon as I get that in, things are going to kind of develop nicely and kind of start to lock in as a whole. It doesn't really matter. What I go for is like flow with the hair. It doesn't matter like what the model's hair necessarily looks like. I'm just kind of using it to give me some ideas for where this, where these marks should go. Um, I've heard hair explained in a bunch of different ways. You know, um, it's kind of heard it explained as a helmet with strands, and I kind of like that explanation because um, it has dimension, but it also has individual bits. So if we zoom out again. Make it small, kind of see that things are coming along. You know, we're um, developing a structure around the nose and eyes, but um, we kind of lost some of the nose structure on the far side in the middle, um, and we've kind of got this annoying gesture line from the beginning. So we might just soften that up there, get some tone going in the nose and kind of on the other side of the nose. And that's going to very subtly make the rest of the nose kind of work. If we zoom out, that change definitely helps for the better. You can kind of see that the form is a little off around the mouth. That with a, a little tweak in, in where that form ends, um, that helps a good deal. You can kind of help define where the lip actually is, too. One of the nicest and coolest things about using the tonal approach is that these very, very, very small changes in value can make a huge difference to your, um, to your piece. And sometimes it's just like the smallest tweak in the world that changes everything and makes everything work. So that's kind of what you're probably looking for with a tonal approach is playing with the subtleties of tone. Um, you know, now I'm kind of noticing that I can start to push some value down. You can see on the cheekbone that the value is a little dark relative to um, other values. So that means that I have the opportunity to kind of start to push some of the value down. So I can go back to the nose and I can push the value down and try to match some of the intensity that I have on the on the cheekbone. And I can definitely push the value down around around the eye socket. As relatively speaking, that's pretty dark. So if I zoom out, I think I've kind of created a better unity there. Um, I've kind of drifted the shadow core out from where it probably should be, so I need to bump it back on the nose, on the front of the nose. And if I zoom out again, I can kind of see that I've brought, brought the unity back to it. Um, 
Yeah, there's a little subtlety here. I can come back and get. Start to get the cast shadow around the nose a little bit more dramatically. Um, that should show up pretty well. Maybe it got a little bit heavy, so I can come back and just very softly erase a little bit. Change the value a little. Um, then, I think what this is calling for at this point is to come in and kind of do what, what we call anchoring, where you start to just commit to some dark areas of value. Right? Push all the way down to as dark as it can go. And it only takes about three to four areas of absolute darkness to kind of fully anchor a piece. And by areas, I mean really small areas. It can be like uh, a quarter inch even in a few spots where no light gets to, and that might be all you need. And when you do this, you want to be very careful not to create too harsh of an edge. If you create a really sharp edge, you're kind of just going to shoot yourself in the foot and be really angry through the rest of the drawing process. So there you can see I've got like four or five, maybe six areas that are like distinctly very dark. Um, and they're probably darker than in the actual photo. But that's okay. So now I have, uh, you know, kind of the, the base level of how dark I can get with, with the piece. Now I can just start to push all the other values down near that and use that as kind of my absolute dark baseline. What I've just done really is I've made room to, re to get the rest of, it, of the drawing dark enough where you can see everything and have, have a good deal of contrast. And so if I zoom out, I kind of see that anchor happening, starting to work a little bit. So in places where I haven't been able to differentiate well, like in the lip, because the values are too close together, now I can kind of change that for the better, right? I have room to make value changes. So I might need to bring a little bit of hair down kind of far to kind of make the value on the nose make sense because you know normally this would kind of seem like where a highlight should should be um, and I can kind of take away some of the earlier lines and do some softer transitions there to help it make a little bit more sense. So that's a quick demo of the tonal approach. You know, I think this piece could probably use more time, but right now there's it's at a state where you can kind of see where all the tone's going. You see a sense of light developing, and you do have a sense of all the form. Um, and it's kind of very different from our previous approach. And in the the last part of this we'll put you know all of the approaches up next to each other so you can kind of see what effect they have um, you know and as you go through and kind of tweak this approach and play with it you can kind of um, you can do a lot with it 
and I think this kind of this isn't this isn't a way that people usually think about it. Most people want like a mixture of value and harsh lines, and I think if you kind of take out the harsh lines and kind of just focus on the value, that kind of um, allows you to extend your capabilities as an artist, an illustrator, or whatever, by sort of dropping out part of your technique. You know, it's like kicking the crutch out from under you, under you and making you walk. Um, so I think if you're able to do that consciously, um, it's, it can provide some interesting opportunities uh, for you. The other thing with the tonal portrait that I forgot to mention that, you know, you can do is, um, if you're working digitally, you can do a texture overlay. And what I've got is a, uh, if I turn off the blend mode, I have a picture I took of a nice piece of art paper. And um, if I take the blend mode and make it um, the overlay blend mode, then I can make my portrait look like it's done on a piece of paper. And depending on whether you have a color or a black and white thing, you can kind of change the the tone of it. You know, so if, if you look at it, this kind of has a cold tone, this has a warm tone, and I think mixed with the digital um, work, this can kind of give it a little bit more of a realistic, more interesting look because you're getting the nuance of actual paper um, overlaid with it. And um, particularly for the tonal approach, I think this works great.